This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with former U.S. intelligence officers. And today, I have an amazing guest. He is an airborne scuba EMT qualified paramilitary officer. He had a 24-year career with the CIA, six different posts overseas, retired as a senior officer. Um, he supported the Contras in Central America for three years. He is the current co-owner of a company called Camp X, and he has a brand new book out called Black Ops. His name is Rick Prado. And this is no Tom Clancy fictional character. This is the real deal. Rick, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you for having me, Jim. It's a real honor. Rick, you're a first-generation American. I'm sure our audience would be very interested in a little bit about your background, your early days in Cuba, and how you got to the United States. Well, you know, Jim, I think that um, my path uh, was shown to me by, uh, by the good Lord uh, very early on by the way that he kind of molded me along the way to um, be able to do what I, what I ended up doing. Uh, I was a child of about seven or eight years old when the revolution was raging. Uh, I literally saw my first firefight two feet in front of my face in, in my neighborhood when the uh, Castro rebels, uh, my town lived, was in the uh, foothills of the mountains where Che Guevara had his troops. So my town being a good sized town uh, was often harassed. So from the very beginning, I started seeing that kind of violence and the consequences that, that war has on, on, on the population. But what was even starker was when communists took, took over, when Castro took over, how quickly the mask of socialism was thrown out the window and we were faced with this monster that is communism. And like communism started you know, feeding on our freedoms. So it was um, very stark to see my dad lose his business, small coffee roasting company, um, six months after Castro had taken over, me wearing these little military uniforms to go to school. And believe it or not, at age nine, my class was forced to go to the campesinos out in the field uh, to the little hooches and try to teach them how to read and write. I'm nine years old. trying, you know, And this was all enforced. In the school, they would tell you if you, you know, if your parents are talking anything bad about Castro, you need to report that that is your duty. So that crackdown was immediate. The uh, the uh, the apprehensions, the oppression of any po uh, political dissent, to the point that when my father uh, decided that we were going to be leaving, uh, we had to leave our home in, in the town and, and we moved to Havana. And on the way in to Havana, I saw with my own eyes much to my mother's chagrin, who tried to block my vision, uh, three men hanging from telephone poles and, and trees with signs that said counter-revolutionaries. That's what they were doing to anybody that opposed them, even ideologically. So, you know, that, that's, that's, there's, that's quite a melding, uh, you know, of, uh, of, of ideas and, and impressions. Um, the end result was I came to the United States by myself. My parents could not get out at first. So I was uh, sponsored by a Catholic church program called Peter Pan, Pedro Pan Project. And that took, you know, over the period of two years, it took about 14,000 kids out of Cuba and placed them either in foster homes, camps. We had three camps in Florida. And I, I don't know if I, if I drew the short straw or the long straw, but I ended up in a Catholic orphanage in Pueblo, Colorado, uh, which in itself was a maturing experience let's put it that way you have five or six different cultures and ethnicities and and the traumas of of all these kids being orphans was um let's say let's just say discipline was necessary and it was pretty strict so rick you've got a very strong paramilitary background did you have um training and experience before you came to the agency yes sir as a matter of fact that's how i got into the agency was through my paramilitary background i uh in 1971 Right fresh out of high school, I graduated in 1970. Um, I grew a conscience about my debt of honor to this country. You know, I, I started to realize that I was living a charmed life in the United States, but the price of that admission was my parents' sacrifice th that they made, putting their only child, I'm an I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, so, uh, only kid, uh, on an airplane to a country that they have never been to or could ever come to. 
So um, I joined uh, Air Force Pararescue, which is uh, one of part of our special operations forces out of SOCOM now. I wanted to go to Vietnam. The, my goal was to go to Vietnam and make a difference. My parents took it very hard because my draft number was astronomical. They would have never called me. Um, so they were unpleasantly surprised when I showed up and I told them I was leaving in 30 days to go to the Air Force pararescue. And um, unfortunately, or in hindsight, fortunately, by the time that I received my beret and finished my long pipeline of training, um, the, um, the Vietnam War was pretty much petering out and there were there were drawdowns that so we they were not sending many of us over there. So I applied to the agency in 74, um, while well, still on, on duty. Uh, they wrote me a real nice letter that said pretty much, uh, thanks for firing, not hiring. You know those years, Jim. Um, and um, so I joined the fire department uh, as a paramedic, um, the usual Prado luck. The captain of the uh, Metro Rescue was a pararescueman that belonged to my same unit that I was there in the when I went through the reserves. So I rode rescue for Metro Dade County for uh, six years. And then I applied again for the agency, the late 79, early 80, and they brought me in on contract to uh, be a, a, a medic on special activity division type training things. So I started doing that for a few months, but they still were not hiring. Uh, so I went back to the uh, to the uh, rescue squad uh, before I lost my tenure there. And I guess it was early 1981 when Reagan took over uh, and decided to do something about the growing communist uh, insurgencies in, in, in Central America. Then he started the Contra program to reestablish you know, the, a democracy in, in, in Nicaragua uh, that had gone extremely communist. And the agency at the time did not have a single native Spanish speaking guy with paramilitary background. And they were all going, what, who was that Cuban kid, the PJ, blah, blah, blah. And they tracked me down and um, they called me on a Thursday. I was at headquarters the following Monday and two weeks later I was in Honduras. Uh, Rick, uh, you are a genuine uh, cold warrior. Please tell our audience a little bit more about supporting the Contras uh, in the jungles of Central America. You know, Jim, I, I, I've had, uh, you've read the book and, and you've known me for years. I've, I've had, like you and many of our colleagues, we've had pretty memorable, uh, you know, uh, careers. And, but if I was to ask, if I was asked to name the most satisfying one, I would have to say it was the one with the Contras. And it took me a little bit to realize that a lot of times when you're immersed in something, you don't have a lot of time to, for introspect. But I soon came to realize that here I was, this Cuban kid who saw his first country demolished by communism and his family badly hurt by communism. And now I am working with these freedom fighters. And for the first 14 months of that program, Jim, I was the only CIA officer allowed in the camps because we were still hiding the American hand. So I was there as a Honduran captain and then Honduran major uh, of the intel and not that everybody believed it, but at least for the media, it was it was it was a good cover. I, I flew under radar. So um, every night, every night I would grab a cup of coffee and I would go sit down at a different fire, uh, little fire pot. And I would ask the, the, the peasants, uh, freedom fighters, um, why are you here? And every single one of them, Jim, had a personal reason. They burnt my church down. They raped my daughter. They took my cattle. They conscripted my 15-year-old son. Those kind of stories were echoed every single night. So very rewarding. And, and some people have asked me, said, how can you live uh, you know, like that for three years? Because I was there for three years. And Monday through Friday, I literally slept in a jungle hammock. And you know what? I never woke up any morning and went, oh, man, I'm still here. On the contrary. It was the most satisfying work I ever did. I had a lot of autonomy, which was also good because I was the only guy out there. So, um, and my mission, uh, as given by Colonel Ray, was uh, make sure that they need you, befriend them, make them like you, and start reporting and start training them. It was that basic. Well, certainly one of the more memorable aspects of your many year career, you went on to do a lot of other very interesting things. Please tell our audience a little bit about fighting against the sparrows in the Philippines. 
Yeah, that was uh, that was an interesting episode. We had a very robust program um, in the Philippines helping the uh, constabulary, the army, and the navy. Um, that was my first liaison job, by the way. It was the first one that I that actually went there to, to work specifically with uh, our liaison partners. And part of our program was a very robust SIGID program, signal intercept program, for uh, helping them against the MPA, New People's Army, and the growing Abu Sayyaf movements down in Mindanao. So um, we had to do, my job was to go out once a week for two or three days to the different areas in the Philippines and see what the situation was, how successful they were doing, what kind of training they needed. I would bring our techs over to uh, to do uh, you know upgrades or training or whatever it was. In one of those times, we were, I think it was in Davao, but it might have been Cebu, one of the two medium-sized cities. And uh, four of us, four agency folks, two techs and, and two uh, ops guys, and um, two of the local officers went to dinner after, you know, 10 hour uh, day of work. And uh, I, I think, you know, my, uh, my, the guy that I was with is, his name is Davis. And uh, he, he, um, he ended up, he ended his career as chief of station there in, in Manila. But anyway, we walked out of the, the restaurant and the modus operandi of the sparrows that, that you just, that you mentioned is that they would carry a 45 caliber pistol, 1911 A1 in the, in their pants, and they would hold it with their left hand. So all they had to do was push that gun up, bring it up, shoot you, put it back and walk off, and people would never even see you, uh, see them. Uh, there is actually a YouTube video. Uh, if you if you Google uh, NPA Sparrows, um, they, that, that comes up, and it's very sobering. So in and, and the climate in the Philippines, it was atrocious at the time. Nick Rowe had been killed. Colonel Nick Rowe had been killed about six or so months before I got there. They had killed two Air Force uh, individuals at, at, at uh, Clark Air Force Base just outside in Angeles City. So, you know, we, we, we were aware that we were being targeted and that, that we would be especially working with liaison that obviously as we walked out of the restaurant, I looked to my left unbeknownst to me, Davis was seeing this very same thing. And I see these three guys and they're in a huddle. And as soon as we came out, the guy in the middle made eye contact and they started walking in front of us three abreast and boring holes in our face. I mean, they were looking at us with intent. So I drew my weapon and unbeknownst to me, so did Davis, because again, total vision is the first thing that hits you under this kind of stress. And, you know, Jim, if somebody points a gun at me, first reaction is always, whoa, or, or something. These guys did not even blink. Mm -hmm. And they just kept walking. And the guy in the middle had this look like, yeah, I'll get you next time. So as soon as they, they, they came out of our, our, our vision, you know, I reholstered my weapon and, 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 you know, adrenaline is kicking there. Davis is trying to put his host, you know, uh, weapon back in the holster and, and light a cigarette, which he barely could because of the adrenaline. Definitely not fear. You know, he, as you know, he was a Vietnam vet, a uh, combat veteran. So pretty tough dude. And he was just the adrenaline. The sad thing was we were the only two of the six that noticed any of this. The two officers and our two techs, our two techs obviously got shoot out pretty badly afterwards. Uh, because they are responsible for their own security also. And, uh, you know, and that's why they carry a weapon. It, you know, lessons learned. Awareness beats fast draw every single time. Because if I would have tried to react to these guys, we would not be having this conversation. And probably neither would have my colleagues. That's a great story, Rick. One of the titles of your new book is The Meat Eaters of Shangri-La. <laughs> What's that about? <laughs> Well, Shangri-La is a country I was not, I'm not allowed to mention the name but per se, but it was a radical Muslim country in Africa, um, ripe with a lot of terrorists. Uh, it was like a terrorist hotel. So there was quite a bit of presence there. So it had been closed for a while, and I, I, we went there as the, uh, the first operational team um, that really started doing some work. And I had pick of the litter. I mean, most of these guys were dual-track case officers. Uh, with paramilitary background like myself, I, I was uh, already a senior officer, and and that's what the the post called for. 
And we were there trying, trying primarily to uh, get, get intelligence on what terrorist activities were going on. This is post Bin Laden. Um, bin Laden was already an established figure, but even some of, some of those remnants were there. Uh, PLO, you, you name it, they had them all. So we were correlating intelligence from SIGIN and NSA and all source and human, and then trying to geolocate some of these and verify, you know, okay, like so and so this house, uh, we believe this guy lives there. And then you go, we take pictures of the cars that were there and run the license plates and, and that kind of stuff. And that sleuth hound work. But the, the, the bad thing, the hard thing about it was this is a primarily black country. White faces, even lighter brown ones, stand out tremendously. So we literally had to do our stuff at night where we would go out in our diplomatic cars, change into soft skin lo local vehicles and don masks that made us look at least from three or four feet as we were locals. And that's how we did uh, our, our snooping in, uh, in uh, Shangri-La. It's a lot of fun. Sounds like it. Rick, as we discussed off camera, Afio does a lot of outreach to academic audiences. And we, like you, also do quite a bit of coaching and mentoring of uh, students and others who are interested in joining the U.S. intelligence community. And one set of questions we get a lot from current and former military is, how do I get into the paramilitary field? Would you like to talk to our audience a little bit about that, please? It would be my honor. I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, uh, of recruiting from the military. Uh, I have actually approached several of our DCIs and DDOs and try to give them a, an insight on, you know, how important this resource is for us. Because, you know, we're always looking for diversity. We're always looking for people of integrity. We're already uh, we're always looking for people of character that has been built and proven and documented. And we're we're better than the military. They, they have the largest diversity and, and the largest form of, uh, you know, uh, what is it? Um, weeding out the, the people that get into the special operations side of the house are usually your best troops, as, as you know, it's obvious. So uh, I get this a lot because I work, like you said, I, I work a lot with the soft. And there's, there's, a, there's a couple of issues that, that, that I still hope the community addresses because one of the problems is they cannot come in staff into the agency if they are older than 36 years old. So what happens if you have a 18 year old that goes into the military, gets his degree, becomes this, becomes that, gets out of 20, he's 38. So he can now apply for contract work in, in, in specialty, special activities division, special activities center now, um, does hire and does have waiver that they can bring in people, but it's a lot more limited as far as writ large. So, but you know, when, when I talk to these young guys, especially the ones that have two or three years in, uh, if, if the guys have 12, 14 years in, I always tell them, I said, do not lose that parachute. You know, get your 20 years, you're talking insurance for life. There's life after that, and, and you could do maybe contract work. But for the younger guys, I inculcate the fact that you have to have a degree. A second language is, is a very big uh, point in your favor. The fact that you will have clearances, of course, and combat experience is, is a plus. We've got plenty of that nowadays after 21 years of, of war. And, and that's how I try to mentor them. And there's, there's a couple that I have helped, as a matter of fact, uh, one young man who's interested in, in going to the agency later on, um, I did a letter of recommendation and he got into Harvard. So he's doing his master's at Harvard. And after that, he's, he's going to apply for the agency because he's young enough to do so. And he's a native Korean speaker, too. That's great. Well, it's an amazing story. The book is called Black Ops, The Life of a CIA Shadow Warrior. It's a great read. And I really want to thank Rick Prada for coming on the program today. Thank you for having me, Jim. It's always an honor.